can't see me. Um, my name is Derek Colbury. I am a research specialist here at the Institute for Cyber Enabled Research. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about how to take advantage of advanced computing hardware in your research to make it go faster. Uh, let's start with a quick definition of what advanced computing hardware is. Basically anything more advanced than the laptop sitting on your desk right here or the, um, the desktops you might have in your, in your lab. Sometimes labs will have advanced computing hardware. You'll have a server in the corner or something that you're, you will log into. Um, sometimes they're at the department level. For example, here at Michigan State, the engineering department has a bunch of computers you can log into. And if you're an engineering student, you have access to those computers. And sometimes they're at the institution level, where here at MSU, uh, that's all at ICER, the Institute for Cyber Enabled Research. We maintain a bunch of really large computers that all of the Michigan researchers can use, Michigan State researchers, got to be clear. Um, but there are, are more national resources available to everybody. Uh, for example, Exceed is a national resource, which I'll talk a lot about today. Um, that's sponsored by the National Science Foundation. But most of the large institutions like the DOD, the DOE, all have their own what we call big iron machines that if you have allocations or, or grants associated with those institutions, uh, you can usually get accounts onto those machines. Uh, NASA is another one that's pretty big. Uh, then there are also commercial, commercial resources. Uh, Amazon is probably the most famous. It's called EC2. You can actually buy a supercomputer. You pay money, you log in, and you do your computation. And what's nice about uh, commercial, soft, uh, commercial systems is you can get it for free. Not for free, it's paid for. You get it almost instantaneously. There's usually no wait for the, uh, the big commercial resources. Um, so why do you need this stuff? Well, generally speaking, your science takes too long, right? You want to all graduate. You want to uh, get your research done. You want to get your papers written. That's usually the reason to go port your software or port your research to a large system. Uh, there are many reasons why your research is going slow. Maybe you're running out of memory. Maybe you're running out of... CPU, maybe you don't have enough disk space, maybe you just don't have the software you need. That might be another good reason to, to switch to a, a, a national system. These are all good reasons to go to a uh, advanced computing system. Okay? So this is what I'll be talking about today. If you have questions, please feel free to interrupt. I'm not used to giving talks across universities through the web system, so Please wave at me or try to get your attention, and I'll try to answer questions at all sites if possible. So my talk will focus, I'll start talking about who am I and why do I get to give this talk. Then I'll talk about specifically Exceed, which is a resource that everybody from all the Beacon universities can have access to. And then um, I'll give you some steps to move, how to take your research and move it into advanced computing hardware and give you a few examples of what we tend to run on these systems to give you an idea of if your application should be running on these types of big machines. Anybody have any questions before I move on? So who am I? Well, I'm a mechanical engineer. I got my degree from Georgia Tech. Woo! Go Jackets. Yes. Sorry. Oh, I appreciate it. Uh, I did a few years working for Delta Airlines as a mechanical engineer, and then I, I did robotic engineering for a while, uh, Fanuc Robotics here in Michigan. And I really like, you know, working with robots and working on airplanes, but I decided I didn't like the mechanics. Uh, I like computers more than I like machines. And so I, I went back to school, I actually got my uh, master's degree from Michi uh, the University of Michigan, which is down the hill from here. And then, um, <laughs> and then I got down the hill, yeah. down the hill. <laughs> over yonder, for those southerners. Um, then I got my PhD here at Michigan State, and my focus was on image processing and pattern recognition. So last semester, those of you who were at the Beacon talk that I gave last semester, I talked about my research in image processing and pattern recognition, specifically my research in image phenomics, which uh, I collaborate with a lot of Beacon uh, faculty on, and I'm a Beacon adjunct, and I like to, my office here is with Beacon, so we're, we're, we're inter, 
uh, related quite a bit. Although this cock really is not beacon specific, it's computing specific. Uh, the reason, my job with ICER is to be a computational consultant. Basically, I help you do your research better. So if you have a question, and I'm sorry, I apologize to the other universities because really I'm helping the people here at Michigan State. Uh, if you have a question with your research and you're here at Michigan State and it involves computation, you can come to me and I can help you answer that question. I might not know the answer, but I might know who does know the answer. Um, usually my questions that I help, that I do know the answers to is how to make my research go faster on whatever computers. Um, usually our computers here. Uh, we do training, we do grant writing, we do all kinds of stuff to help you. Uh, I'm also, and I love this picture, uh, I'm also the uh, Exceed Campus Champion. I've been an Exceed Campus Champion, I think, since 2008. The Campus Champion program was started by the National Science Foundation. Uh, universities designate uh, people as a champion for the university. And what are we champions of? We're champions of advanced computing hardware. Basically, my job here at ICER, but on a larger scale. Uh, we are all volunteers, the campus champions. I say all, I'm actually an exception. Uh, but most campus champions are volunteers, and our job is to help you do your research, maybe answer questions, and help you get on to resources such as Exceed. Actually, primarily Exceed, but uh, campus champions will help you with other resources. Um, so the, the next question is, what is Exceed? Oh, before I continue, I forgot a step. I just started this month, on January 1st, as an employee of an Exceed. So I am basically shilling for them now. So this whole advertisement for Exceed is because I work for them too. Uh, I am now in a, I support the Campus Champion program. I'm actually a Campus Champion champion. Uh, so my job is to train Campus Champions on how to do their jobs better. And so I just got hired this, uh, not hired, I got a sub-award from them this semester to start this program. So this is actually one of my very first duties as a Campus Champion champion. I, I like that. I'm going to use that as my title. Campus <laughs> Square. Champion Square. Campus Champion Square. Okay. And uh, I'll do that. And so um, that might explain some of my slides. So what is Exceed? Formerly it was something called TerraGrid. So those of you familiar with TerraGrid might know that Exceed is just a fancier name with a big X in it. Um, the National Science Foundation awards a grant, and I don't know how, how often, I think TerraGrid lasted six years, um, which is quite long for an NSF grant. Um, might have been longer, but I'm not positive. Anyways, and then when TerraGrid was done, a bunch of the people from the TerraGrid program got together. Actually, they submitted two different proposals. One group submitted one proposal, another group submitted another proposal, and the National Science Foundation picked their favorite one. It happened to be called Exceed. And then the National Science Foundation said, do both proposals. And so that's just how it works. And so this is the new, um, it's, it's a virtual organization. So the idea behind Exceed is, let's say you're a university, let's say Michigan State, uh, you can apply for a grant for a supercomputer, which we want to do. All right? You can apply for this grant, and the National Science Foundation says, yes, you are doing a lot of interesting research. We will give you a supercomputer. But there's a huge, large caveat on that. And it says, if we give you this big supercomputer, if we let, give you all the money to build this supercomputer, you have to share it with everybody in the United States for free. That's the condition. Because the National Science Foundation supports research across the United States. Their deal is if they help you install a big supercomputer is that you have to share it. So how do you share it? Well, since the National Science Foundation funds many different supercomputers, they don't want a different way of sharing every different type of supercomputer. It can get very confusing. So they made the Exceed organization is to be a virtual organization, one place to go where you get access to all the different resources. Okay. That's Exceed. And there's a lot. There's actually a bunch of new ones that are not updated on this slide. Uh, Stampede is one of them. And um, that's the basic idea behind it. So what kind of research do they support? Well, 
officially anything that NSF supports, any research the National Science Foundation supports, can run on the Exceed supercomputers. Though Exceed itself as an organization doesn't limit itself to only NSF funded research. Uh, they'll, they'll fund any research as long as they have uh, the resources to, um, to support it. And when I say fund, they're not actually paying for the researchers to do the research. They're giving researchers uh, CPU hours on these large machines. So last year, actually this is now two years ago, uh, they allocated 2 billion CPU hours, approximately, with uh, 1,400 allocations and 350 institutions. And gives you a, this slide gives you a general idea of where the types of research is going on. But there's a lot of other research in these categories. Yeah, go ahead. In, in that slide, uh, so those numbers are not uh, determined from above, are they? It's depending on who applies. Yeah, it does depend on who applies. Uh, generally speaking, physics has always been a big player, and um, so they happen to have a lot of grants. Um, yeah, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Lot Exceed actually supports a lot of fringe science, too. If you apply and you're doing something unique, you're actually more likely to get an allocation because they like to support new and unique initiatives. Uh, this is just a subset of the many different types of science that is new to computation. Not necessarily, well, not all of it's new to computation. I see particle physics there uh, and molecular dynamics. But uh, the general idea is that they do a lot of different types of science. And if you are a NSF funded, um, if you have an NSF funded grant, which All the Beacon does, you should be able to get onto these systems. Everybody gets on for free, but you will have a slightly higher priority than everybody else because you have the Beacon grant you can put on your proposals. Um, so gaining access to resources is all about allocation. You have to get an allocation on a resource. And there are many different types of allocations. Uh, the first type is called the Canvas Champion. I, all the Canvas Champions are given a small set of allocations on a variety of the hardware. And what we do is with our allocations is that we make it quick and easy for you to try things out. So if you want to try something out on Ranger, for example, you can say, hey, Dirk, I want to try my code, see if it runs fast on Ranger. I can give you access to my allocation in just a couple of days and you can be running on Ranger. Uh, but I don't have a lot. I can't share you too many of my CPU hours because I have to share it with everybody. They also give away startup allocations, which are a quick and easy way to get on. There are education allocations. So if you're teaching a class and you want everybody in the class to get on a supercomputer to, to, to do an experiment or a lab or homework or something, uh, you can get an education allocation. Those are actually quite easy to get. We got one from Beacon two years ago, I think it was, maybe three, I can't remember. Uh, we used, uh, we were trying to run a beta, and unfortunately for that allocation, I picked the wrong resource. Uh, I was new to it, and I, I, I picked the steel resource, uh, and I should have picked a different one, because the way the class worked and that resource worked, it was hard to get jobs done. And we ended up bringing the entire class and using uh, the HPC instead. Now. If that is your only experience with Exceed, that was my mistake. Okay, so if you want an educational allocation, you say, oh no, Exceed sucks. That was because I made a mistake. I actually think now that I know more about it, we can do a better job. Uh, the majority of resources are, are, are acquired on these uh, machines using something called an X-Rack. Exceed Research Allocation. And um, these are large, up to 10 million CPU hour allocations that you get for one year. And you have to renew it every year. Um, but to get these, you have to submit a 10 page, basically, proposal. And they only review those proposals every four months. So they're pretty big. And, and usually there's a, oh, they're all free. Catch that? Free. Um, but you do have to get accepted. Um, and generally, there's a three-step process. If you have a campus champion, which everybody here does, and frankly, I don't mind sharing with the other universities of Beacon, too, if you don't have a campus champion. Uh, I can get you on an account really quick, and you can test your code out. Immediately after we do that, I'm going to tell you to, to, to submit a startup allocation. That's 200,000 
uh, CPU hours you can get within two weeks. So basically my Canvas Champion will hold you over until those 200,000 start and then you can start running some experiments. The 200,000 CPU hours are meant to get your feet wet on the machine, learn how long it's going to take to do your research so that you can write a proposal to get an X-Rack. It's basically a stopgap for the four, hundred, four months between the X-Rack uh, proposals. And once you get an X-Rack, you, you, you got lots of CPU time and you should be able to make, write all types of really wonderful papers and get a Nobel Prize. And what else, what other goals do we have? Oh, graduate. <laughs> graduate is important. Um, that's the basic idea. There are other things, other types of allocations. They're smaller, but Exceed supports a lot of different types of resources, not just hardware. Hardware is by far what we are most known for. Uh, but there are other things called portals, where you can, there's also kind of a hardware allocation, but it's a social media, kind of like Facebook, but for your research domain. And, and researchers can get together, create a portal, and you know, share ideas, share algorithms, and actually submit jobs on the portal to a, to a machine in the background. They're really quite powerful. There's also training and testing. If you're doing research in high-performance computing, you can look, you know, get an allocation on Future Grid, which is kind of different than everything else. It's a virtual machine. Um, and there are many other allocations. One of the allocations I want to point out is something called ECSS. And I apologize because I have no idea what ECSS stands for. I know what it means, I just don't know what the letters stand for, because it's an acronym. But ECSS is user support. So if you get an allocation on, let's say, Stampede, which is one of the newest machines on the system, and you just don't know how to use it, or you've ported your code to it and it's not running as fast as you want it to, well, first thing you should do is talk to me, because maybe I can help you. But if I can't, we can apply for an ECSS, and we can actually get people from TAC, which is support Stampede, and they will help us get your code optimized. And so that's one of the allocations is not only hardware, but actually you can allocate for people. You can actually get people to help you on your research, which is really nice. Okay, I did a quick search of um, our Campus Champion website. I was assuming all the Beacon universities would have Campus Champions, but I was wrong. Only Michigan State, we have two. We have me and Ben Ong, and we sit next to each other just down the hall. Most of you know us, at least here. I looked at the other ones. The only other one to actually have a Campus Champion is University of Washington. I don't know Jeff Gardner, but he was listed on the website. So he is your Campus Champion if you are from uh, University of Washington. He is like me, but there. Um, <laughs> And then, the only other thing, it's actually surprised me, University of Texas at Austin doesn't have a Campus Champion, but they have one of the, the biggest supercomputing sites. So my guess is they probably don't need a Campus Champion. If you have a question, you can just walk to their site and ask them if you are at University of Texas. Um, so TAC, uh, Stampede, which I've been talking a lot of because I think it's an exciting machine, is at TAC. Uh, they're a very large part of Exceed. And the other two universities don't have campus champions, I'm sorry. If one of you would like to become a campus champion, contact me, we can arrange that. Or if you just need to talk to someone about Exceed, you can always talk to me. Any questions? Okay, that was my seat. I like C you, Dirk. What? <laughs> I didn't hear that. I like you. Okay, yeah, just keep, send me an email. Um, so that was my advertisement. Uh, about Exceed. It's a great program. It's a great way to get resources beyond what you can get maybe locally. And actually, once you graduate and you're used to using all the wonderful resources we support at ICER, and you go to your new university and you go, I wish I was back at Michigan State to use ICER, you can say, oh wait, I remember Dirk said I could get access to Exceed for free. Alright, so what is this stuff? Um, here's the procedure to getting more work done, okay? First thing you gotta do is connect to your resource, whatever resource that is. You might need to get an allocation as part of that process. Uh, then you, once you're on your resource, you have to determine what software you need. Um, maybe it's software you wrote, so you have to transfer those files into that computer, figure out how to do that. Uh, maybe it's using software already available on that computer, and you just need to transfer whatever input data uh, you need. Once you've got all your files transferred, you might need to compile your code. 
maybe. And then you want to test, usually on something called a development node, a login node. You test your code, see how it works. And then what, on all these machines, you write a submission script. Basically, it's a list of resources that you want to use, how long it's going to run, and uh, what, what, you want the, what do you want to do in that job. Then you submit a job, it goes into a batch system, it runs on the supercomputer, and when it's done, you write your paper and you graduate. Yes? Is the submission script similar to the one that we use here? At okay, submission scripts, we use, a, we use something here called a batch, portable batch system. It's very common. Uh, most sites have a variation of PBS submission scripts. But they might not, they're not guaranteed to. There's another one called Slurm. I know that that's what they use on um, Stampede. It's different. It's similar. The concept is different, but the syntax is a little different. Uh, I've had um, submission scripts I've written here and just ran perfectly fine in other systems by adding like one line, like my allocation number. Um, but it varies on the different resources what, what, what the scheduling system is. Uh, and if you need help with that, you can contact me. Their actual website's pretty good about explaining the, the nuances between them. Any other questions? So if you need a third party software to run, mm -hmm. say, a file equivalent or some CFD software, and if, if you don't have it uh, in the source, then how do you proceed? Well, there's two types of third party software. There's open source. If they don't have it, you can install it. Or if you can't, they can install it for you. Um, usually, users can install it in your home drive, no problem. Uh, if it's a, a commercial software, that's the harder one. A lot of these resources have commercial software, like Fluent is out there, you were talking CFD, Fluent is out there. Um, a lot of them have OpenFoam, which is a fluid dynamic software, but it's open source, so if it's not out there, you could install it. Um, if you have to pay for it, it's a different level of complexity because different light, it depends on the licensing of the software. Uh, and, and that's, it's more lawyers than it is software. Of course you can run it, but the lawyers tell you. So sometimes you can purchase software and the license says you can't run it on someone else's computer, in which case we're kind of stuck. But we do have MATLAB running on some of these machines. There's Abacus, there's Fluent, there's a lot of available software. Um, not all of them have everything, but you, there's actually a, a tool on their website that you can say what software you want to use, and it'll tell you all the machines that have it. Um, good question. Anything else? I, yeah, go ahead. I have a question. I'm looking at you. Oh, oh okay. So, um, for compiling, especially like for the open source programs, uh, do you really have to link into parallel libraries, or can you do single node compilations that are distributed? Um, if you're doing truly distributed computing, you want to pick the Exceed resources that are designed for distributed computing. So, Exceed has a Condor cluster, for example, that is quite extensive. Uh, that is meant for highly distributed computing. Um, running distributed, each of the resources have different rules. Um, the one that I liked the best was called uh, Steel, which was at University of Purdue. And Steel, you could run single-threaded jobs as many as you wanted. But that one just retired, so uh, there's actually a new allocation coming up, and I'm not sure which, what machine will replace Steel. But uh, if that's the type of job you're running, we can arrange it, uh, uh, figure out which hardware to run it on. Um, yeah, it's just sometimes the parallel libraries will break the compilation and you can have ten different programmers work on it and it's just... Oh, if, if you don't need the parallel libraries, you don't have to compile them in. It's just, it's more of a policy of the hardware. They don't like running many, some places do not like running many serial jobs. Uh, I don't know why. We, we have no problem with that here, but uh, some, some places do. And um, it's more of a policy issue than a need issue. Um, from a practical standpoint, you don't have to compile with the parallel libraries. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Cool. All right, so let's talk about parallel coding. I know a lot of the Beacon users actually don't need parallel, but I'll, I'll cover that. Um, generally, when we talk, 
let's correct that. A lot of Beacon users don't need parallel, fancy parallel libraries. Um, but generally speaking, there are, there are three types of problems when you're dealing with your code. They're either CPU bound, meaning you need a lot of computation done, think simulation. Uh, memory bound, which means you just need a lot of memory, think genomics. Um, they're not necessarily CPU bound, but you need to access memory and a lot of memory uh, all randomly. And then there's I.O. bound problems where you're, you're, you're pulling in a lot of data, you're doing some small analysis on it, then you're saving a bunch of new stuff. Think anything image analysis, uh, anything large, big data like astronomy, that's all I.O. bound. And then your problem might fall into many, more than one category. But most advanced computing hardware is designed to solve one or many of these problems. And the different types of hardware are designed or optimized for different types of problems. So if you know what type of problem you have, it's easier to pick the type of hardware you need to run on. And so here are the steps to making your uh, program run faster. Okay, the first step is to analyze your code. Uh, use a profiler, see where your bottlenecks are. I give this example a lot, but I was uh, riding my bike through campus. It was at night, and a friend of mine named Eric had his bike propped up on a light post, and he was looking in the grass around the light post. And um, it was a different Eric. Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, so I got off my bike. I said, hey, what you doing? He said, I lost my keys. And so I helped him, and I got down off my bike, and I'm looking through the grass. And we were there for 20 minutes looking for his keys. And uh, finally I said, well, Tell me what happened. And he goes, well, I was riding my bike way over there. I heard my keys fall out of my pocket, so I stopped to go find them. And I'm like, but why are we looking over here if you dropped your keys over there? And he said, oh, the light is better over here. <laughs> you don't like that joke? Yeah, but it's like 15 years old. <laughs> but there's a reason. I have a, I have a purpose for that joke. When I help people optimize their code, they come to me and they say, hey, I need my code to go faster. I've been working on this and working on this, and it's just not going any faster. And I look at their code and I say, why did you, you got it to go faster. It was taking three minutes, now it's taking three seconds. And he goes, yes, but my, my whole job still takes two weeks. And I'm going to say, well, why did you, so how many times do you have to run this thing that took three minutes? And now only takes three seconds. You go, oh, I have to run it once at the beginning because it's just loading in my files. And I go, why did you waste your time optimizing the loading in the files where that's not where you're spending your time? And he goes, that's what I knew how to fix. Okay, so it's not, that's where the light was. And so I really emphasize, do not do this embarrassing thing, and I apologize if I make some of you blush, premature optimization. Okay, premature optimization is a problem that I see very often. The idea is you take your code and you optimize a piece of it, and that was not the bottleneck. And the way you know, you might think it's the bottleneck, but it might not be. And the way you know is to run a profiler. You, you, you benchmark your code, you find out where you're spending all your time, and that's the piece you will optimize. Not what you think you're spending all your time, but what you're actually spending all your time. Once you've done that, the very first thing you should consider doing is optimizing your code. Making your code smarter, okay? Yes, you can parallelize, but chances are you'll get more speed up by doing smarter code than you will by throwing more hardware at it, okay? That's where you come talk to me. I know lots of tricks, things like trading money, uh, trading money, trading <laughs> memory for time. You give me some money, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the idea here is if you do a calculation, the exact same calculation over and over and over and over and over and over again, well, do it only once, save it in memory, and the next time you need to do that exact same calculation, which would get the exact same result, you just read it out of memory. That's called trading time, uh, memory for time. And there are lots of ways you can do that in your code to make it optimized. So, that's definitely your first step. That's where you're going to get your most bang for your buck. But there's going to be a point at which it's a rabbit hole you're going down where you're optimizing your code. And sometimes it's just better to just throw more hardware at it. So we're going to talk about parallelization. And in parallelization, you want to look for loops, look for pieces of your code that you can run at the same time uh, that won't interfere with each other. So 
That's the idea. And there are three types of parallelization uh, that I like to point out that runs on advanced computing hardware. The first one is called pleasantly parallel. Uh, some people call this embarrassingly parallel, but I am not embarrassed by it at all. So it's a pleasant thing. If your problem falls into the pleasantly parallel, that's the easiest one to solve. There's loopily coupled and tightly coupled. So pleasantly parallel, the idea is you have a bunch of tasks, and they're completely independent from each other. From beginning to end, they don't need to talk to each other. Um, Beacon is a great example of pleasantly parallel. If you are running a search through a genetic space, and you want many i got to use the right terms. Uh, a very large population. You want to make your population bigger, you just run it on more machines. Um, that's the general idea of pleasantly parallel. And that's a, a loosely coupled problem. There's no communication whatsoever. The hardware designed to do this are di highly distributed hardware. Things like Condor is excellent at doing pleasantly parallel. Exceed has a lot of different hardware that can run pleasantly parallel jobs, so come talk to me and we'll, we'll see what you're doing. We actually have one Exceed user in the room who is running pleasantly parallel jobs in, from Beacon on one of the Exceed computers. So that's a Condor machine, right? You're running in Condor. Excellent. Then there's loosely coupled problems. These problems, you have a master process and it distributes the work to a bunch of, of worker nodes. And they are independent of each other. And then they do a little bit of calculation, and then they talk back to the master node. And then the master node decides what to do next, and then dishes out the work again. Uh, think of about a simulation that has time steps. So the worker node splits up the problem into a bunch of chunks, sends it out for one time set, sends it out to all the worker nodes. Then they send it back, and the master process looks through the chunks, see what has progressed in the simulation, splits up the problem again, and sends it back out. Um, that's common. Uh, the amount of communication goes up when you have a loosely coupled problem. Then there are tightly coupled problems. These are problems where you might have a master node that distributes to a whole bunch of workers, but then they can all talk to each other. And the more communication you have, the more powerful computer you need especially the bigger the simulation need. And uh, the fastest type of communication is called shared memory communication. That's where you're passing information on memory in a computer where multiple CPUs can read the same piece of memory. Memory is very fast, so there's a lot of shared memory parallelization, but it has a limit. You can only go as big as the computer that has the largest computer that has shared memory. So for example, here at ICER, we have a very large machine. It has 64 cores and two terabytes of memory. That's a pretty big job. You can go from one core up to 64. They communicate through shared memory. And uh, lots of fast, really great parallelization can happen. But it doesn't scale indefinitely. You only scale it to the size of the system. Uh, and a loosely coupled, you can actually scale bigger usually using something called a message passing interface or a network um, communication uh, where you're communicating between nodes through a network. And, um, that's a little slower, but you can go much bigger. So this is what I said. Shared memory is typically the fastest. You can also do something called shared file system parallelization, where basically you have a bunch of computers. They all have access to the same files. And you read, you, you write out a file, and then the other processes can read from the file. It's actually a very slow way to communicate between processes. But if you don't need a lot of high-speed communication, it's very easy to write code that does shared file uh, parallelization. And then shared network is all the computers are on the same network. Uh, so a lot of times those networks are very high speed networks, especially on like computers here at the HPC or one of the Exceed computers. They use something called InfiniBand or Gigabyte Ethernet or 10 gig E, some really big network connections. So that it's a lot faster than an internet connection like you would have to you know, Facebook. Uh, these are all computers highly coupled together. That was a brief overview. I'm willing to answer questions uh, before I go on to the next set of examples. Uh, this was not meant to be a tutorial. Does anyone have any questions before I move on or want something clarified? How about the other sites?
Are you with me? How much data can you load up to the seventeen processes? Depends on the resource, of course. Um, I was just, I'm on a project using a resource called Gordon, which is at San Diego. They have allocations of up to three petabytes. So if that's not enough for you, um, maybe you need to buy your own computer. <laughs> um, most allocations are not anywhere near that large, but they have the capacity to handle that. I'm actually working on a project that might actually get close to a petabyte, just of video data. So, like a typical need for classified kinetic challenges can be about a terabyte. That can be pretty standard across these cell of the NC resources. Oh, I would say a terabyte's not bad. Uh, you can. Find, it depends okay. on the resource. Uh, Steel, for example, wasn't anywhere near a terabyte. They had five gigs for their allocation, which was ridiculously small. Um, here at ICER, we give away, uh, not give away, we, we offer a terabyte uh, pretty readily to our users, and I'm guessing most of the big systems will do the same. A terabyte's not that much data anymore. Um, and that's hard drive space, not RAM. We have machines with a terabyte of RAM. Yeah. yeah, we have machines with a terabyte of RAM here, and there are a couple machines on Exceed at Blacklight with a terabyte. Though we have two terabyte machines, and they don't, so we're winning. <laughs> Oh wait, I work for both now, so... Oh, yeah. So you're always winning. I'm always a winner. Excellent. Good questions. Do you have others? I'm, I'm all out of my good questions today, so... Uh, Forgive me, what, what, what uh, university are you guys from? Uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Oh, North Carolina. Uh, oh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, so I'm just now going to finish up with some examples of the types of problems we tend to run on these machines. Now, like I said, there's a lot of new research going out there, and your research might fall into different categories, but I like to generally throw a large net and say that there's a three, three's always a good number, uh, three basic types of problems that get run on supercomputers or advanced memory machines. Those are boundary simulations, data analysis, and search problems. And I would argue that most problems fall into one of those three categories, or overlap those three categories. Um, so a boundary problem is, the basic idea behind a boundary problem is you have some sort of simulation, and you chop up the virtual world that you've built into chunks. And those chunks might be in two dimensions, they might be in three dimensions, and the analysis you want to do uh, for each time step happens locally and inside each chunk. That's where your parallelization comes in, is inside one of these little boxes. And then at every time step, every box trades information with its neighbors. Um, and then the next time step happens. And so during a time step, you ignore all your neighbors and you just calculate what happens in your box. And then at the, then at the edge of the time step, you trade information with your neighbors and you go on the next. That's considered a boundary simulation. It's very common, it's actually well, probably one of the most common large-scale types of simulations that go on on these machines. Um, there's all types of problems that fall into this. Fluid dynamics, finite element analysis are big ones, molecular dynamics, weather simulations, those types of things. They're big, big simulations that fall into um, uh, boundary simulations. Generally, these are systems of partial differential equations, though not always. Generally, they're very large partial differential equations, which happens to be mathematically equivalent to an inverse of a matrix. Uh, so a lot of what we do is inverse very large matrices, um, though not all. And I'm curious, the other sites, can you see my video or not? A little choppy, maybe? Uh, this is a video of one of our researchers here who uh, simulates uh, using hydrodynamics code how stars are formed. Really cool stuff. And all done in very large scale boundary simulations. These problems tend to be tightly to loosely coupled. I mean, during each time step, the thing in your box can ignore its neighbors pretty much, but there has to be a lot of communication. And if there are a lot of time steps in the simulation, there's an awful lot of communication. 
Um, there are problems that can be solved on specialized hardware. Actually, you pick a type of hardware and there's someone who's tried to solve a boundary problem on that, or tried to solve a boundary problem on that hardware. Here's an ex example of a hydrodynamic simulation that's actually simulation the formation of our entire universe. I love that. Uh, and this, this particular simulation uh, is zooming in on a piece that creates a spiral galaxy that looks a lot like our own spiral galaxy. And so with this research, they were able to uh, possibly see how our spiral galaxy was created. Pretty neat stuff. Uh, data analysis is my second type of problem. You have very large, or maybe even not so large, set of input files. You have to do some sort of computation on them, find some features, uh, count something. There's all kinds of things that happen. And then um, you output the results uh, of what you're looking at. I do a lot of image analysis, so all my examples are image analysis. This is all just data analysis, where you have lots of data, you crunch it, and you pull it out. Think Google is a big data analysis problem. Probably one of the largest parallel prop jobs going on in the world, and it's a big data analysis problem. Um, bioinformatics usually falls under the data analysis. You might not have a lot of data, but you have to do a lot of computation on top of a lot of data. Uh, astrophysics does a lot of uh, kind of data analysis problems. I'm guessing a lot of people in here have very large data analysis problems. They're generally loosely coupled, but that's not, none of this is a rule. Uh, so when you're working with lots of data and you're doing, looking for features in that data, a lot of times you can just load up the data on a wide range of different computers and just give them each different input values and they can process it all independently of each other. Uh, they're very nice problems. And usually data analysis, though not always, is pleasantly parallel. You can just do it everywhere. The biggest problem I see is that it's I.O. bound, um, or in the case of bioinformatics, memory bound. Um, that just means that you have to pick the right hardware to do the problem you want to do. Uh, my third example, wow, I went fast. Oh no, we started at 6.30, or at 3.30, so I'm good. I thought I was done in 15 minutes. Uh, the third problem is a search problem. Uh, you, there's different types of search problems. There's brute force search. There's uh, Monte Carlo search. There's different types of search problems. Uh, but generally, most of them are some sort of random search, especially in the case of uh, protein folding is a good example of a search problem. Uh, you randomly generate a bunch of possibilities. You test how good those possibilities are, and you repeat till found. This group probably understands search problems very well. A lot of the genomic searching problem, or uh, no, I said genomics. Uh, help me. Genetic algorithms, thank you. Uh, the genetic search falls into a search problem. And, um, I actually put Avita up here, Keys. Those are all good large scale search problems. Uh, there are others like Ransack and Marty Carlo. These are all types of problems that happen a lot. They also tend to be pleasantly parallel. Um, and what I really like about some of the Monte Carlo searching is I can throw more processors at it, and all I do is get better answers. Uh, I might not get actually a better answer, but I get more confidence that my answer is correct at least. Um, typically, search problems are not I/O bound unless you're searching through data, but you know you're searching through. Uh, some sort of equation space or simulated space or something like that. Um, and they're typically not memory bound though, not always. Okay. So, to summarize, if I can do a summary, advanced computational hardware makes you do your research faster so you get done faster. That's all good. Um, when you're paralyzing your code, you need to understand what you're doing. And how do you understand it? Well, you have to study your code. If you don't know what to do, you come to see a specialist. If you're at Michigan State, you can come see me or Ben. 
If you're at a different university, go see your local university specialist. If you have one, if not, give me an email and I'll try to help you too. Um, that's the general idea. Does anyone have any questions? Was this helpful? Yes. Do you find the whole workshop an exceed? An exceed workshop? Wasn't planning on it, but we could. Um, if you want to use XP, come see me. It, it's not much, it depends on the hardware, but it's usually not much different than using our local system. So an XE workshop might be cool, but I would find more benefit out of doing an HPC workshop of local resources and then only move the people to exceed that need more than what we can offer locally. Or that want to use advanced computing later in their institutional life. Once they leave the years. I don't understand the question. I mean, we can use HPC here, but why would you We need to use something like this. Okay. Yeah, and you can find a lot about Exceed on the Exceed website if you don't, if you go someplace you don't know. I mean, it's a public, it's a virtual organization. There is no one place that it's located. And so wherever university you go to, if they don't have a representative of Exceed, okay. well, you can just log onto the website and you can find out more about it. And if you're really lost, you can email me back and I will be happy to help you. I have a question. Sure. Um, does it support any cloud-based protocols? Cloud-based what? Protocol. Protocols. Protocols. Future Grid, which is one of the exceed resources that is actually a cloud resource. Uh, Future Grid is not its own machine. It's actually a cloud machine that is running on many of the different exceed resources. Um, so you can do virtualization with uh, Future Grid if you wanted to spin up your own virtual machine and run it off on a uh, hundred different computers, you theoretically could do that through Future Grid. None of the Exceed resources specifically offers a cloud resource, but it's becoming very popular. And my guess in the next round of resources, based on the success of Future Grid, that it truly was a correct name is now a lot of the resources will do exactly what Future Grid is, which is basically a cloud-based resource. So the idea behind a cloud, for those of you who don't know, there are lots of definitions of cloud, but the one that Exceed chooses to use is that you can have virtual environments where you spin up your own cluster that has a, your own operating system on it that's yours, and that is a dynamic system that can spin up and spin down dynamically in a cloud-based way. Uh, and Exceed's trying to head that direction, but only resource we have is really future grid right now. So if you're doing research in that or, or you find that valuable, it's actually, you know, future grade might be the way to look at it. Was there a specific task you were trying to do? Well, you know, everybody says the cloud is great. I'm actually a skeptic of cloud-based computing, but I have a number of collaborators who think it's just amazing. So that's what I guess. Um, yeah, uh, go ahead. I've heard some of these uh, GPU uh, companies like NVIDIA They've been promoting um, desktop supercomputers. So I was just trying to get your opinion. Yeah, so honestly, with a few GPU cards in your computer, you can have a supercomputer that 10 years ago would have required a full room. And I'm guessing 10 years from now, the same thing will be true with some other new hardware. Uh, GPUs are an excellent form of accelerator technology. So I'll tell you all about GPUs now. Uh, the GPU is actually a card that goes into your computer that was designed to play video games. And it does video graphics really well. And in about, right when they first came out, researchers said, hey, if I turn my science problem to make it look like a graphics problem, like basically fool the GPU to think it's rendering a bunch of graphics, but it's actually doing my science for me. And a bunch of scientists, clever scientists, figured out how to do that with certain problems. They made their problems look like a graphics problem. They ran it through their GPU, and they got amazing speed ups. And NVIDIA specifically said, hey, we kind of like that. And so they wrote a programming language called CUDA. And they said, and then they started selling GPU cards without even monitor ports in them. <laughs> they said, here, buy a GPU card, and you can now run your science on this, and you can write your code in this language called CUDA, which makes it, quote, easier to write code for GPUs specifically designed for science. It's a very powerful way. There are a lot of good science projects that use GPUs. 
We bought a GPU cluster here at MSU, and we still use it. It's a very powerful machine. Exceed has a bunch of GPU resources also. It is an excellent way to get speed up. That's the good news. <laughs> the bad news with GPUs is they're really hard to program. I know that I said they had a programming language called CUDA. It is extremely difficult to, to take your code to get the speed up you might want out of a GPU. The advantages are large. If you can do it, you can literally do some of your own science on your desktop that you would normally need a big supercomputer for. So, and then if you had a supercomputer with a bunch of GPUs, you can even do that much more science. That, so that's a big advantage, uh, but it's really hard to get your code to look like a graphics problem. And that's essentially what you have to do. Uh, Intel just came out this month with a card that likes acts sort of like a GPU. It's called a Phi card. Um, GPUs have like two, uh, 300 cores on them, but they're special graphics cores and they, they don't act like anything you're used to. The Phi card has 61 cores on it and they're all called x86 cores, which essentially are the same thing as in your laptop. So you have a 61 core card that you can write code, you can take your code that you wrote for your laptop, compile it, and run it on a, on a Phi card without making any changes. Now I'm not saying that's going to make it run faster. You still have to do a lot of complex programming. But if you have a problem you want to try out on an accelerated card, it will take you at least a week, maybe two, to get it running on a GPU the first time. To get it running the first time on a gra uh, Phi card it will take you 10 minutes. And then you can spend the rest of your time optimizing that code. Uh, I really am excited about Phi cards. The Stampede thing that I keep bringing up is a brand new cluster that has Phi cards. It's at TAC. It's an amazing machine. Uh, I know that here at ICER we're planning on getting some uh, Phi cards immediately soon. Um, it's a neat technology that I say doesn't replace GPUs because GPUs still have more cores, but goes side by side to GPUs. And really, I haven't played with it enough, but my feeling is if you optimize your code to work on Phi, it will actually be easier then to move to GPU. The, it will kind of be a stepping stone. That's my opinion, but I haven't tested that yet. Good questions. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>